Okay, we are opening the Wetlands Bylaw Review Subcommittee meeting on March 18th at 12.04 p.m. Okay. So I'm just going to start with general provisions section one. Um, let me just queue it up and then I will share my screen. Okay. All right. <clears throat> so um, you guys, I'm going to um, I'm going to just jump right into it, but please stop me at any point, uh, Leroy, Michelle, if you guys have questions on anything, okay, at, in any of these sections that I'm talking about. Um, Michelle didn't have any comments on intro. Leroy, I don't know if you do, if you do. Um, okay, so purpose. Um, Michelle added this comment here, uh, add protection of wetland plant communities. So <laughs> these are, so that, under the Wetland Protection Act, there's eight interests. Um, and under our bylaw, there's like, I wanna say whatever it is, like 13 or something. Um, so these are actually written into the bylaw. So just to kind of give you guys a like a, sort of a snapshot of this. So the bylaw was adopted by select board town council. And that was something that the town council approved. And then the regulations are something that the commission holds a hearing to create. So a lot of the components in the regulations are pointing back to the bylaw. And so there are certain things in the regulations that we can't change, because if we do, then it's not going to be in compliance with the bylaw. Um, in this case, these are the interests that are spelled out in the bylaw. So adding in an additional interest. Um, doesn't work. However, the section that I'm saving for April, that's the big resource area section um, that's completely being redrafted. We, we can add protection of wetland plant communities in there. So we will just, just so that comment, it can't be in there as an interest for the bylaw, but um, unless we rewrote the bylaw, which we may want to do at some point, but um, for these regulations, I would say that let's save that for that section. <clears throat> uh, forested wetland, that's a great question. So I just met yesterday with um, Alex Weisite at KP Law to go over um, some of the other sections. And um, he did actually suggest that in the resource area sections definition that we define as many types of wetland as we can. And when I say define, I mean label. So like types of um, freshwater wetland might include um, forested wetland, wet meadow, um, you know, anything that's not, that isn't already spelled out that is important to include, we should include. So that's another place where this will be inserted. Um, and we, we could actually insert those here as well. Um, I believe we'll, I'll double check to make sure that it coincides with the bylaw, but, um, we'll, we will add those provisions in and I'll keep that as kind of a placeholder until we do that. <clears throat> okay. Um. Just reading real quick. I think I probably have the same comment as Michelle. Okay. Actually, no, those are good points. Uh, mine was, uh, I was a little confused. Uh, where we started, uh, any activities subject to regulations on a bylaw proposed within 50 feet, all the way through to the end of that paragraph, it seems like we could just go zero to 100 feet, unless I'm reading it wrong. It seems like it's broken into zero to 50 and 50 to 100 for no reason. So this is one of the areas that I broke out 
um, in the language. And the reason that I did that was, and, and this is another thing that we should really talk about and dig into. And as we get through some of the sections, we're gonna, you'll see, I'm, I'd really like to hash out some of these things. So my general um, guidance to applicants when people are filing either an RDA or an NOI is that if they're closer than 50 feet, I always suggest a notice of intent because anything within 50 feet is, in my opinion, very likely to have an impact. And then anything that's outside of 50 feet, I usually suggest a request for determination. Now, again, it depends on the project. If it was a commercial project, I would just say file an NOI. Um, if it was a, you know, a corner, uh, a corner of a septic system, I might say you could file an RDA. Um, there is a little bit of discretion there, but generally speaking, that's why I inserted it like that, just for guidance related to it does um, it is redundant i see your point there Leroy. it kind of says mm -hmm. the same thing twice just zero to 50 50 to 100 so i don't know if you intended okay. to make the language slightly different but i think it's just the same sentence just different oh it's just repeated over yeah i have a different distance classes Okay, I think that there's actually a typo there. Um, so it's supposed to be activities subject to re regulation under the bylaw proposed within 50 feet of areas subject to protection under the bylaw shall require a notice of intent. And then it should be any activities subject to regulation, blah, 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 um, under the bylaw shall between 50 and 100 feet shall require filing of a request for determination. That's what it should say. So thank you for catching that, Leroy. I that was a mistake from on my side. Um, okay, so Michelle, your point here is definitely a good point and I 100% agree with you. In Sturbridge, we had a 200 foot buffer around wetlands <laughs> and anything within 200 feet, we required a permit. Um, I don't disagree with you. Um, how would you suggest that we would you just suggest we change the wording like so that it's not stating what it states? Let me just reread everything. I mean, so, I think the, I think the point of it is that if something's proposed outside of 100 feet and we think it's going to have an impact, then we could require a filing. I think that that's what this is ultimately stating. Um, See, so now or, it says outside of and over. Oh, unlikely. To, okay. Um, I mean, I wasn't on the conservation commission that determined that something outside of an over a hundred feet is unlikely to affect a wetland. Like, I don't agree with that because it's mm -hmm. super project dependent. Um, I so, think uh, if we could. If we're going to change wording to make it less definitive, then the word shall is the target. If we can change shall not regulate to something different, or maybe we even drop that uh, phrase entirely, uh, we could just stop it as uh, areas subject to protection on the bylaw are unlikely to alter those areas, period. It doesn't mean that it won't, and it doesn't take away our authority to regulate them. Yeah, and this this section here. So a good example is um, if if there's a site where there's disturbance outside of 100 feet, and we get a huge storm and material washes out from outside of 100 feet into a resource area, we could then take jurisdiction over the area outside of 100 feet because it's altering a resource, and that's the only time that we can take jurisdiction over that area. Um, so we don't get jurisdiction until something has happened. So if it's like they measure it and if it's 101 feet away from a resource area, they don't have to file a notice of intent. And so we're not even going to have our eye on it or anything. It's just, I mean, it's, it's yeah. probably out of our hands. I don't know. It just, it kind of, I think this maybe gets back to what we discussed briefly about maybe changing, um, the numbers. Um, mm -hmm. I just, I feel like it's very site dependent and project dependent and like having a hard number where we're saying 
nothing is going to affect anything in a wetland if it's 100 feet away from it is I mean like if it's an upslope 100 feet that's really different than I don't know that's that's the intent of my comment I just um I don't know exactly what to do with it I like Leroy's suggestion for at least how to make it not so definitive at this point Uh, I mean, I'm just proposing something here. This is not anything we have to do, but like my, I like what Leroy suggested in terms of unlikely to alter those areas, period. And then saying, if an activity outside of 100 feet of an area subject to protection results in the alteration of an area subject or area subject to protection under the bylaw, uh, the commission may take jurisdiction. <clears throat> over that area. I mean, I can wordsmith that a little bit, but that's another way of saying it, I guess, that might be a little more clear. But uh, you guys I like it. I mean, I that's pretty good off the job. Yeah. OK, I'm impressed. OK, <laughs> OK. All right, well, I'll, I'll wordsmith that a little bit more, but we'll Kind of keep rolling with this for now but i think that's a good maybe in between option <clears throat> this is a great one this section makes me very happy the burden of proof and this is also in the wetland protection act and this sort of brings me back to a certain project that we're dealing with currently where the question was to us well tell us how it's not altering or tell us how it's altering a resource area. And the question is, you tell us how it's not altering because they're the applicant. They're the ones who are supposed to be doing the explaining. And I think that's what this whole burden of proof section is, which is very good. Okay, so I'm gonna save this and we'll go to section two, unless there's any other comments. Oh, okay. Um, all right. Um, which one was it? Definitions. Okay. <laughs> okay. Um, so I'm just going to start at the top. And again, you guys jump in at any point if you have any comments. <clears throat> what I did here was exactly what we had discussed when we initially looked over it. I looked definition by definition at what was listed in the Wetland Protection Act. There were multiple um, duplicated ones. And I actually removed like, I want to say like four pages of definitions from here um, that were duplicated from the Wetland Protection Act. And how we handled that was I took those out. And then I just stated all definitions in these regulations are presumed to be the same as Wetland Protection Act unless otherwise noted. Um, so there's, there's that. So that shortened this section up quite a bit. Um, I added in a change there, Michelle, for you, per your comment. Thank you. Um, clear cutting. OK, so Leroy, were you able to get into OneDrive with my password, or did you have trouble? I had trouble again. Oh, OK. Me too. Right. It's not just okay. you. <laughs> OK. All right, I'll reset that. And I might use a number, because it, maybe it was just the a typo. I did check it and it worked for me, but um, who, who knows what that was about. Anyway, I'll tell you what my um, reasoning was here. And again, this is completely up for discussion and, and um, we can change this. It's, it's not set in stone in any way, but <clears throat> there was, when I went, I read through this, this silviculture paper, um, which went through all of the different, um, it was a, a silviculture 
um, white paper that went through all the different um, cutting practices that foresters can use. And um, there was sort of this whole section on clear cutting and you know, clear cutting is to remove every single tree, but then it was like, well, what are things, what are practices that result in similar end results, except not completely cleared? And then there was a couple examples of those. This one was the closest I could find to clear cutting that maintained sort of a, a clutch of trees in the middle of the property. And so that's why I kept it because I liked it. Um, in the sense that if they're keeping, because it's called a um, a seed tree cut when they do that, and they're leaving six trees well distributed on one acre, which really isn't a lot um, on an acre. So thinking, and I did add in the comment there, mature trees for, for you, Michelle, and we may want to <laughs> further define what mature means, like six inches at diameter diameter breast you know at breast height or whatever um dbh we may want to add something even more definitive in there to to identify that but um that's where i came up with that it wasn't like i just plucked it out of the sky um and that is in that one drive folder so i'll make sure that you guys get um a link that functions so that you can see that do we want to i mean so you sort of broke down the definition of seed tree by just saying what seed tree was. Do we want to include seed tree as defined by something like the Forest Service or some just some, I don't know, guiding guiding resource um, that you know just shows where we pulled that number from and sort of the intent because it, it seems a bit arbitrary as written. Um, because you mean seed tree, that that's like the definition of a seed tree is six acceptable, well distributed seeds per acre. So maybe just including the, the, the name seed tree cut. And then I guess the reason I don't I, I agree, like we should look think about mature a little more because it's I don't know what that means. That could mean like on the end of a life, too. But um, right. There's yeah, it like could be a, a dead snag. Out. Yeah. So, <laughs> I mean, I've seen like coals do big cuts and they just leave like the scraggly pines or, you know, because they're not useful lumber or like there's a cut on Market Hill right now and they're leaving these like scrappy little trees. And I guess like just so that, I don't know, just to define it so that the intent remains, which is there'll be some regeneration and, you know, maybe like native trees. So it's not just going to be like tree of Atlantis or whatever tree of heaven or Catalpa or you know, I don't know. Catalpa, I guess is sort of native, but um, I, I don't know. I would, I'd love to get other people's in opinions and expertise on this section because I'm not a forester, but Leroy, you're you are a tree guy. Why don't you? Like, it, I'm Leroy. curious to get your to get your opinion on this. Uh, my opinion on DBH. If we're going to pick a number, I'd go higher, maybe ten inches. But the tree, okay. obviously, we got a lot of trees growing at different rates. So DBH alone is kind of tough to go with. Uh, another way to say mature is a tree that's actually seeding or fruiting. That kind of gets close to age without measuring size necessarily. Um, I kind of, oh, well, not kind of, but I definitely like Michelle's point about native trees. I don't know how we would necessarily get that in there without them putting in just a full list of acceptable trees. You know what I mean? I'm just, I'm just making notes of some of the comments here. We can yeah, edit this. Yeah, I wonder if we can refer to like a mat, like a mat. I don't know what would it be like mass deep deep whatever, they, there must be some kind of like maintained list of native tree species that's at a regulatory agency higher than town. Um, well, the other thing we could do is, is add a definition for native and um, specify a tree that grows, you know, yeah naturally yeah. in massachusetts i don't know if we're gonna make us if we're gonna have little random bits of tree or even little islands of tree 
it would be really important, I think, to somehow establish a zone around those trees where essentially vehicles, logging equipment cannot be driven over or whatever. Yeah. The root system is going to be the most important part of the regeneration. Um, if you're allowing them to cut right up to that tree, though, I don't really know how you do that. You know what I mean? They need equipment to cut trees. So, but yeah, I have know, seen seeding trees. and root zone are the most two important things about coming back from clear cut here. I'm just adding in your notes because I think these are all good comments. <laughs> Um, also, if we could, if we do somehow define that it needs a, let's say, a well structured root system, whatever trees are remain, uh, that would prevent a lot of, like Michelle was talking about, half dead trees or snags are about to fall over because you can clearly see they have no roots on one side, you know. Because if it's sitting and it's got a good root system, it should take care of itself every time. So it's mm -hmm. just, I mean, I like where we're going with this because we're trying mm -hmm. to make sure that our intent holds through a cut. But in reality, like, so would you, Aaron, be like going out and evaluating the trees left and then you would get like a violation if they didn't? Well, know. the way I see it is that this is, this is not necessarily going to be something that we're going out and enforcing per se. I think it's more to establish a definition okay. so that if somebody's saying, well, this isn't a clear cut, you know, then we could say, well, this is our definition of clear cut. Um, you have to have at least this many trees left. So it's more so like a, something that we can point to that's a little more definitive of what our expectations are. Um, and it doesn't, we don't in any way restrict clear cutting at all. So somebody could propose a clear cut. This is mostly to say what is a clear cut and what is not a clear cut. It's not meant to restrict a clear cut because a clear cut could be done for establishment of early successional habitat. And that might not be something that we would want to restrict or, right. you know, um, regulate in some way. You know, we want people to be able to establish diverse rich habitats um, in town. It's mostly just so that we have a way to distinguish between what is and what is not a clear cut. Got it. And so the first sentence of that states the majority of live trees from an entire stand. And then we say, like, then we give a specific number, which I don't know, I'm just thinking about, is there any conflict there? Like if there's, it's a forest and there's only six trees left after a cut, it's already the majority, I don't know. Yeah, and I mean, I think, I think that what is important for me in this definition is the um, alteration, the word alteration. And that that's a very, very important word in the sense of in, under the Wetland Protection Act, if you, and under a bylaw, if you alter an area, then you have to meet the performance standards of our bylaw or the Wetland Protection Act, which means replacing or restoring or, um, you know, so for example, like, you know, if somebody's doing a, uh, a clear cut, maybe this means that they have to stay out of the buffer zone. You know, maybe it means they can only clear a certain portion of the buffer zone. Um, so that we have something to hang our hat on in terms of saying, well, that is indeed an alteration. Um, mm -hmm. that, that's kind of, I think, why I felt like that was an important definition to include. I can 100% agree with that. It's a really important thing to have. So listen, I want to keep us moving just because it's almost 1230, but we, we can come back to this. We, this is not like you guys have to um, make a decision on this right now. Um, what I will do is this version that we've marked up, I'll save to the OneDrive, get you guys a new um, uh, um, 
password for it. One thing I do want to make sure of just from a, um, a procedural standpoint is I'm going to upload a Word document and I really don't want you guys going into OneDrive and editing that Word document. Like you guys can save it and mark it up on your own and send it just to me. Okay. But it, it's, it, what it does is it's where it's outside of an open meeting and I don't want it to be an open meeting law violation for you guys to be editing and, you know, sending things to each other because it's, it should be done during an open meeting that we talk, talk about this and review. Um, so I'm just going to keep moving. Um, but we can come back to this. Any comments, we can revisit this. And, and again, we can also talk about this with the whole commission as well when we open the hearing if we'd like to. And I'd really like for you guys to do a lot of that presenting during the hearing of these changes, but I'm happy to, you know, be there. Um, so this next, this is another definition that I added, the competent source. And this is something that has come up over the course of the time I've been doing this. This has come up so many times of who is a competent source. Um, this definition came from the requirements, I believe, for doing a wildlife habitat evaluation. And that's something that DEP has pointed at many times for me when I was asking what's a competent source, because we've had people who were questionable competent sources come through and say, I'm a competent source. And I said, well, how do we really, you know, there's no way to quantify that really. Um, now, Michelle, you made the comment and here. So this would mean anybody who comes before the board with a proposal, with a, a permit application, would have to have at least a master's degree and two years of training or experience. That, you know, people with batch, I've seen people with bachelor's degree who, degrees who've been doing this for 50 years who are very competent. Um, so I'm a little on the fence about requiring that, but I'm definitely. Um, you know, if you guys feel otherwise, I'm not going to argue with you. <laughs> I, I mean, it was a question. So I was just, I, I leave it up to your, you know, professional experience and having, um, you know, seen people, a lot of people come through. So if you mm -hmm. find this sufficient and it's like it consistent with DPW's definition, then that sounds good to me. Yeah, I mean, and the, the other the other thing that has occurred to me because we've had this come up before is that, and I don't know if this is something we would want to do or not, um, and we, it might be more for like a procedure section, but if somebody comes before the board and is deceptive or, um, you know, unprofessional and uh, you know, does something that makes the commission, gives the commission the feeling that they're doing unethical um, work. I, I almost contemplated whether we might want to include something that the commission reserves the right to, you know, in, in situations where they feel somebody's in, you know, not a competent source that we could, I mean, we can always get a third party reviewer, but I didn't know if we wanted to call that out specifically. Um, so something to think about. Uh, can I just put 14B? Yes, of course. Um, architects twice. So I'm hoping we could just strike one of those and put in certified arborists. Uh, I feel like this year we've been relying on them a lot for the hazard tree emergency certs. Absolutely. Um, and Architects and landscape architects are two separate um, professional registrations. So that's why they're listed. Yeah, but architects is twice. Yeah. Oh, 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 I see. Thank you. Sorry about that. Gotcha. Sorry about that, guys. Okay. All right. Does that look better? Awesome. Thank you. <laughs> All righty. Um, okay, so after we met, or after I drafted these, there was a couple additional things that occurred to me, a de definitions that occurred to me that we would want to include in here. One of them being impervious surface. And um, 
I think that these are really important to include because a lot of times there is discussion about whether something is impervious or not impervious. Um, and, and I don't think that that should be something that we squabble about with an applicant. Like we should have a solid definition for it and something that we can point to based on an application. This came from Law Insider Dictionary, um, prevent or impede infiltration of storm water into the soil as it entered in natural conditions prior to development. So I added that in since I gave you guys a clean version and I wanted to call that out. Um, Michelle. I think that's a really important definition to have. I'm really with you there. I, okay. We might have to work on some wording. I'm just thinking right now it says impede it all. And doesn't Amherst allow certain things like decking and gravel, which are an impediment, but. Yeah, and again, this isn't necessarily meant to restrict impervious surfaces in any way. It's mostly just to define what is and what isn't. Um, so like, and, and it's a great question too, Leroy, because I think there's a lot of gray area on that one. Um, you know, I've, I've had people argue that decks, and, and a lot of times it comes down to how they're constructed. Um, you know, a good, a good um, uh, carpenter will leave a space not, like in between boards on decking so that water can get through. But um, I'll, I'll, sometimes um, carpenters will put the boards tight to each other so water can't get through. Um, so it's, you know, it's, it's almost, <laughs> it's almost, a, it's a, it's a difficult thing to nail down. Um, and I think there is discretion associated with what we consider to be impervious or not. Um, for what it's worth. <laughs> but I'm happy to make any wordsmithing changes and we don't necessarily have to make them right now, but um, if you have any, I'm very uh, open-minded to that change. Yeah, I'll have to think on that one. Okay, yeah, that's, that's completely fine. I kind of dropped these changes in at the, at the uh, 11th hour, so. Um, Michelle's question here, greater than 5,000 or 500 feet, does a vernal pool need to be greater than that? This is, these are great questions. Um, and I'll also, I love the comment about vernal pool complex and we'll come back to that as well because I think that's something that we need to pull into the resource area section that if there is a cluster of vernal pools that those might be important to leave interconnections in between. Um, Where did that 500 square feet come from? Is there I, I believe that? that's from Wetland Protection Act um, okay. originally when it comes to um, ice, isolated land subject to flooding. And I think a lot of this, Michelle, is to prevent small areas like puddles and driveways, for example from yeah. somebody coming along and being like, that's a vernal pool or that's a isolated wetland. Um, Understandably. Um, yeah. I'm, yeah, I, I, don't, I mean, I don't know like if there's biological thresholds for vernal pools at which they are not important, but um, so yeah, I just don't know if, if like vernal pools that are 15 by 15 um, or, you know, very long or, whatever deep but small and might hold water for a long time and therefore be important for breeding amphibians like are, are we discounting a whole class of vernal pools by by saying right here that they're considered an isolated wetland like i don't know if you added that sentence or not but are we um i don't know but that last sentence sort of like couches it into isolated wetland and then is it then subject to 500 square feet and should vernal pools have like a little bit of different criteria than that 500 square feet? And that should probably have like an ecological, you know, logical base to it, which I don't know, but that's just the point that I was trying to 
Yeah. yeah. Um, Michelle, I was going to ask you, actually, if you might be willing to do a little research on I that. I did. I sent you stuff. I know, <laughs> but, but I know. But was that paper, did that paper specifically talk about sizes of vernal oh, pools? No, I didn't. Um, it was more about the importance of the complex like right. populations. Yeah, Which I, I think is amazing that. and wonderful um, that we have that. I'm just, I'm, I'm curious about your question and I don't know the answer and I would suspect that you're in, you're right. I mean, if you think about it, I'm sure that there's tons of those little, very productive little, and I mean, I, it, it makes me think about Hadley for some reason. And I, I wish Dave, like, I wish Dave Z was in on this call because he's told me so many times that there were these like really small pools in Hadley that had breeding uh, habitats of spadefoot toads previously, and they were not jurisdictional and they ended up getting filled in. Oh, well, there and you go. All, all that habitat was lost. And now there's like very little habitat for them in Hadley. Um, so I think that that's, you know, a very spot on comment. Um, and I think we should, particularly when it comes to vernal pools, we should be very deliberate about what we, the changes that we make and may try to make them as um, solid as possible in terms of definitions and protections. Okay. Well, right now it worries me that vernal pools is couched with isolated wetlands. Okay. Because if we are considering that maybe like depth of vernal pool is actually another criteria to like, um, you know, to evaluate it as like a, as an important resource, you know, because yeah, it's like freshwater wetland could be like a marsh. Uh -huh. That's what I'm thinking of. So you're thinking of taking out this, just that. Or just say, if we define it somewhere else, be like, it's a type yeah. of isolated wetland with, with like other conditions as listed in blah, blah, blah. I don't know. I just okay. want to safeguard um, us from losing vernal pools because of that arbitrary number if it's not I, meant to apply to vernal pools. I 100% agree with you. And we went through this recently on an application, actually. And that's one of the reasons why I wanted. So, and, and just so that you guys know, in the, in the previous version of the regulations, vernal pools was a subset of isolated yeah, wetland. That, oh, in the previous version? Well, right. So the, the current, in our current regulations, which are in use, vernal pool is a subset of an isolated wetland. So that argument was actually made that, oh, well, you know, if it's smaller than this size, then it's not a vernal pool um, because it's vernal pool would fall under the subset of a definition of isolated wetland. So if it's not an isolated wetland, then it's not a vernal pool. You know, there was a lot of teasing apart of the regulations over that definition. And so I want to make sure that that doesn't happen again. And so what I did was in the section that I'm trying to rewrite right now, and town council helped me a lot yesterday looking at that because they agree the way that it's broken out is, is not good. Um, Vernal pool is actually going to be its own separate resource area in the new regs. So it's not going to be couched under isolated wetland. And it's not meant, isolated wetland is not meant to restrict what is or is not a vernal pool. It's mostly to say that an isolated wetland can be a vernal pool and a vernal pool can be an isolated wetland, but the two can be independent of each other as well. You know what I'm yeah. saying? I, yeah, I totally agree with that. I guess that, just with, without some language in there that says, but also, you know, but also subject to the further definitions of blah, blah, blah. It kind of is, I feel like limiting that's all I'm saying. Yeah. And we may want to, we may want to just take that little last sentence out too. Yeah. You need to just delete it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And I'll, I'm just going to um, put a little note here about that, but yeah, I com I completely agree. And I think we need to be really careful in the final version that we have KP law look at. I think we should specifically ask them, make sure that they're comfortable with that. Uh, but we'll, We'll wordsmith that and come up with some edits on that. Leroy, did you have anything else you wanted to add on that? No, um, I would say I'm leaning towards striking the entire line. Okay. Um, I, I was going to say we could put a separate definition in this section, but if you say there's a big section for it in section four, then that should serve us just fine. 
Okay. Yeah, I think that's I'm, a simple answer. Okay. So I'm just going to, part of the reason why I'm doing this is that we're going to be putting these online for people to review. Um, and so I want to keep track of what changes are being made to what versions. So I will do an update of this to incorporate these changes for like our final review with the commission. And I'll try to um, come up with something between now and then. We're definitely coming up. This 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 deadline is coming in hot on this uh, on this uh, regulation revision. <laughs> so I'll see what I can do to help with that. Um, it's going to keep rolling here. Okay, self-imposed hardship. This was one that I added in. Um, and so when I first started as a conservation agent, um, I was reviewing a subdivision proposal. A uh, landowner in Greenfield had a huge piece of, of property that they decided to subdivide. And in doing so, they several of the lots in this subdivision, they cut off upland access to the lots. The commission denied it and it went to appeal and DEP ended up upholding the commission's decision because they said it was a self-imposed hardship of the landowner that in fact the landowner in carving up the lot had created their own hardship by eliminating an existing upland access to the lot and they said that that individual could no longer have access to their lot because they made the choice to eliminate their existing upland access and that doesn't give a landowner the right to then alter wetlands to get to the new lot so even though that's standing case law i also felt like it would be an important thing to include here because i think the discussion is going to come up again and again particularly in amherst where most of the upland has already been developed and many of much of the land that we see remaining is marginal and has wetlands on it. And we're going to see a lot of subdivisions in the future on these large marginal properties getting carved up and this question being asked. Um, so that's why I included it. Sounds good. Nip it in the bud. Yeah, and I meant town attorney. I already asked for um, help with this one because I want it to be a um, solid definition there. <sighs> okay, did I miss a comment from Michelle on there? No, okay. Um, any other comments, please stop me. I'm just gonna keep burning here. Um, I added in a definition for structure as well. And again, not married to this definition, just felt like we should have a definition. Because I think a lot of times people will argue, well, that's not a structure. Like if it doesn't require a building permit, it's not a structure or, um, you know, there's a lot of arguments made that certain things are not structural. Um, I've after built so interrelated parts, just pieces. So what if it's like a, a formed, I don't know, that I thought about this that. definition from somewhere. I'm just thinking about like prefab things or like I don't know, chicken coops that are, I don't know. I'm sure this is fine. Uh-huh. Yeah, I mean, like I said, if you guys have any ideas for making this better, um, I'm all all ears and open to it. I just thought it would be an important definition to include. What about tree houses? You just say on the ground and I don't know, tree houses are like right. a hot topic for parents right now. Right, right. Well, and and it's interesting you mentioned that because there was a, on this link that where I found this definition and I looked through a bunch of definitions, there was another one which said it could be on the ground or cantilevered over the ground. And this is another discussion I've had, like, because a previous commission I worked for, they had actually a no impervious surface 
under their regulations. Like they said, there's a 50 foot no touch, but there's a 75 foot no impervious surface. So you could do something that was pervious, like pervious pavers, but there was a situation where somebody wanted to put like a cantilevered addition onto their house. And they said, well, there's no, there's no foundation under it. So that's, you know, it's not impervious. And um, the argument, you know, it, it can go back and forth, you know, it can yeah. go back and forth and it's not really meant to complicate it. It's mostly just to have something loose, a loose definition mm -hmm. that we can go by. Um, but yeah, I'm happy to revise that. There's our vernal pool definition. Um, I think we should take another look at that as well, probably make sure that that's solid before we, I'm not saying right this instant, but before we bring it to the commission maybe. And I think that's all for section two. Did you guys wanna talk anything more about section two at all? Okay. So section three, <laughs> da, 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 da. hold on one second. Procedures. We're never gonna get through this section, <laughs> but um, I did make sure um, to incorporate the comments that we had, we spent a lot of time on this section, the three of us um, previously. Um, I did add in this, um, there was an applicant who proposes to work on a lot greater than 50 acres and I added in is required to provide notification only to a butters whose lot is within 300 feet before it was within 300 feet of the work area. Right. So I added in 300 feet from the property boundary to make sure that that was clear. Um, I also added in certified a butters list so that people wouldn't be pulling the GIS reports off of the town website if they're inaccurate or land had changed hands. I know you guys have not had much time to look at this section, so um, I will put it up for you guys to comment on if you'd like to. Um, I do think that the last couple weeks of this process is going to be hopefully a little bit, you guys, I might hope that you guys will do a little bit of homework in terms of reading these and coming back with any final edits before we, take it to the board um, in early May for full review. But, you know, the board may have markups as well. So there is more time if you guys don't have time to, to mark these up again. Um, I did break, I, I combined the sections for request for determination and determination of applicability. Before these were two separate sections and I felt like it was extremely confusing. Um, because there were things that were in one section that related to another section and vice versa that really they just sort of belonged collectively together. Um, I did the same thing for notice of intent and order of conditions because they were broken up into two different sections. Um, this is not a comment, but just a thank you. Uh, notice of intent number five. I think you ended up doing really well in the wording there. I know oh. we've been stonewarding for a long time. I think that works though. Yeah, definitely an important one. And, you know, it did occur to me. Um, thank you for mentioning that, Leroy. It did occur to me that there are going to, well, I'm curious. Okay, let me ask you guys a question. So under the Wetlands Protection Act, when somebody files a request for determination, when we receive that, we are supposed to hold a public hearing and issue the determination within 21 days. That's state law. There are occasions, and recently we had one of these, where a request for determination was extended um, with the permission of the landowner. And um, 
and that's completely fine. But there are situations where information that comes to us um, doesn't really detail the impacts clearly enough or the information that comes to us, it might actually be sufficient for review under a request for determination, but ultimately, um, like I'll give you an example, having a couple more pieces of information would help the commission to be more comfortable issuing a negative determination versus saying, no, you need to, in addition to this file, a notice of intent. And so that specific requirement around stormwater, I think is a really important one because it falls underneath the notice of intent and order of condition section. And there may be instances where the commission wants, and I'm not saying full on stormwater calculations, but there may be situations where the commission wants additional drainage detail to make sure that there's not any scour that's going to occur at, um, you know, the outlets of roof drains or French drains or foundation drains or um, who knows what, you know, um, there's so many things that can cause stormwater issues and runoff issues on a single family house lot. So something to think about if we should include something about that in request for determination. Right now that's all falling under buffer zone um, under our performance standards. There is some notes about drainage and um, uh, point source discharge and um, like two year, 10 year and 100 year storm events looking at the calculations, but under a request for determination, it might not always be appropriate to require those. Um, do you guys follow what I'm getting at? Am I explaining this clearly? <laughs> yeah, I, if we go that route, we're gonna have to have similar wording where it's just discretionary every time. Uh-huh. Okay. Uh, so if we wanna put that in, we could, some form of uh, at our discretion. But again, if it's gonna be on a case-by-case -case basis anyway, we might not wanna put anything in writing at all. Mm -hmm. What do you think, Michelle? So this is sort of parallel to the stormwater best management practices and just trying to well so yeah so under request for determination this is kind of like um just procedural right but it doesn't say anything under request for determination regarding stormwater and that's the reason why i specifically called it out okay. um because because it says under number five under notices of intent that the commission may require at its discretion stormwater best management practices be implemented on any site where it is deemed necessary to protect. Gotcha. Um, um, and we, we may yeah. want to include that under request for determination as well. It has been coming up recently, right? So I think it would both, I, I'm, I'm supportive of it. Um, because I think it should be accounted for in that in that part of the procedure, and you know, give us some authority, even if it's just discretionary, to consider mm -hmm. it, and that the applicant would know that that's within our purview to consider. Yeah, I can go ahead and put it in. That's why I like the wording so much, Aaron. Is it's the may require and discretion, so essentially mm -hmm. every option in the book forever. So yeah, I see no reason to not also put it under RDA. Okay. Let me just take a quick look here. I'm gonna put it underneath um, section four here. I'll fix the formatting later. <clears throat> if it doesn't, oh, there we go. Okay, all right, I just plugged that in there, okay. Okay. Um, thank you for reminding me of that, Leroy. <laughs> I wanted to um, make you guys aware of that distinction. Um, there was, um, some of this, some of these changes came from the Wetland Protection Act. It was very weird like some of the 
um, reasons for denial under wetland protection were included and some of them were excluded, which didn't make any sense to me. So this now includes all of the same reason and rationale that it can be um, denied under Wetland Protection Act. That's right here, failure to use this section here is what I'm referring to. There was a lot of really weird, uh, like, things that were copied over from wetland protection but then like one line would be removed and I'm like what is what's up with that it seemed almost like it was like a either a typographical error or somebody left it out on purpose um all right a lot of this is just standard requirements for um legal notices coordinations with other boards I did include um electronic versions i inserted that specifically so that it was clear it's not like we had to be sending these certified to all the departments um some of these didn't change the security section didn't change that's like a bond that could be held by the commission for assurance that something was done right I think just a typo error in uh, section uh -huh. line number one, second line says area delineation one or one times. Could you could you uh, direct me where that was again, Leroy? Uh, extension of permit number one, second mm -hmm. line, and it says delineation one or one times. Oh, second. Second line. second line in the paragraph. Yeah, I see where it is. I'm just reading it. The commission may extend the order of conditions or order of resource area one or more <laughs> times good catch. for a period of up to three years. That was a good catch. Thank you. You guys really do your homework. You guys said, get yeah, A+. Thank, plus. <laughs> thank you, Leroy, for going through it so thoroughly. I didn't have as much time as Oh, this is good. Well, I felt bad because I didn't have time to put up electronic comments, so you went on that one. <laughs> Well, hey, it, it doesn't really matter. As long as we get them in there, that's that's at the end game. Uh, I put in some conditions for extension. Um, so, you know, that flagging has to be in place to issue an extension, uh, that it must be in full compliance to get an extension. So there can't be a standing violation on a site to get an extension on a permit. Um, some important ones anyways. Um, and under enforcement, there was definitely, this was one that I went through with um, Alex Wysight. There was definitely some wordsmithing that went on there. Um, we did make sure that <laughs> um, entering property meant we had permission of the landowner. Um, and then these, these violation sections, this is another one where it was cut and paste from the Wetland Protection Act, but some sections were removed. Um, so this is now complete. It's apples to apples with Wetland Protection Act, which is how it should be. Certificates of compliance is pretty standard. Um, oh, uh, there was a lot. I think we went over this whole section recently, but there was a lot removed um, under the enforcement section. We took out a lot of the, there is still information on fining, but there was like 10 paragraphs literally in here on fines. So we took out a lot of duplicated, stated over and over again items. Um, emergencies, this... Um, was again taken from wetland protection. And I added this in mostly just to help people, but I think we went over this, who, what, where, when, and why on an emergency certification. I'm sorry, but I was hoping we could get to the end of this. And I don't know if you guys have any comments. I didn't wanna rush you guys through this, but um, this is pretty solid section that I went through with the town attorney. So there wasn't, you know, um, I mean, there were a lot of changes, but it wasn't um, anything from a really a content standpoint. It was mostly just getting rid of that superfluous information and making, did I say it right? <laughs> okay. 
Say it again, Michelle. Superfluous. Superfluous. Is that how you say it, Leroy? I mean, I... I, I think I say it the third way, like superfluous. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Whatever. <laughs> so I'll just be all individualistic with it. <laughs> all right. So anyways, it was getting rid of a lot of duplicate stuff, making sure it was consistent with Wetland Protection Act. But I think there was some really good changes in that section. And I see that it's one o'clock, so I don't want to take any more of you guys' time unless you have additional comments. I'm going to upload these changes, edits to the OneDrive. I'll make sure to get you guys um, a password that actually works. Please let me know. I'll send you a new password. Please let me know if you're able to get in. Um, and I, Michelle did ask that I double check on the reminders from Zoom because she's not getting them. So I'll double check for the webinar that you guys are both getting reminders. I Hopefully I can. I've not been getting those yet. I have for regular meetings, but not for bio. Yep. Okay. I will double check that. Thank Is there you. anything else that you guys have? Nope. Thanks for all the work on this. And so Thank next you. week, next second in two weeks is our two hour meeting. Is, that, is everybody still okay with that one? Yeah. Um, that, the goal of that is going to be to review the resource area chain. The, um, uh, which one is it? It's the um, standler, standards for inland, um, standards for inland wetlands. Um, I don't know how I'm going to get it done in two weeks, but I'm going to do my best and uh, we'll just try to get through it. Okay, well, if you if you don't have it done and we need to talk about uh, rolling that to our, we can, you know, we can discuss what works, but. Yeah, we might need now. another two hour later in the month, um, but we'll see how it goes. Um, the the last the last section is again that's the fees one so and i think the two important things for you guys to keep in mind and i'm sorry i just want to say to, the important things to keep in mind are the fees if you guys have any changes on fees to think about that but i'll upload those sections so you can comment on it and then the other thing that's really important for the next session is to think about resource area impacts and particularly buffer zone because Amherst is very, very lax about buffer zone alteration, um, allowing up to 35 feet. A lot of communities have a 50 foot no disturb um, and even some, you know, like incorporating, like not allowing more than like 20% alteration of the entire buffer zone on a property. So just think about those things because those are going to be really important for us to talk about. And that's going to be a clean version that you guys are looking at. It's not going to, it's going to be very different than the last, uh, you know, how we were looking at the whole document that that section is, is so difficult that I'm going to just have to start basically from scratch and um, I'll copy over and paste where I can, but um, not going to be able to do it with the whole thing. So. Okay. All right. With that, we will close the meeting at 1.07. And adjourn in two weeks, adjourn until two weeks. Thank you, everybody. Thanks, guys. Have a good day. Have a good weekend. Enjoy the weather. You too. Bye, guys.